Okay. All right, so uh, maybe we could get started. Um, <clears throat> first, let me just uh, uh, thank all of you so much for coming. It's a really terrific turnout, and uh, I really appreciate it. I know uh, Peter and Rodrigo appreciate it as well, so thank you so much. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I wanted to start out this, uh, uh, the, our evening's events with just some, some thank yous for uh, all the people who, who, who supported in various ways and worked on uh, the <coughs> exhibition, The Nature Drawings of uh, Peter Carklin's, and, the, um, and also the, 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 the catalog uh, 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 that accompanies the, the exhibition. Um, I'm Sean Kirkland, by the way. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I uh, probably should say that. Um, and I, uh, I uh, co-curated the, the exhibit, and I'll, I'll explain exactly what that means in detail uh, later. Uh, but uh, with uh, with uh, Louise Lincoln, uh, who's uh, the director of the museum, she right over there. So, uh, um, <clears throat> so what I'd, uh, I'd like to start with is just uh, the um, thank yous for the the. Uh, the actual uh, the the sources of, of money uh, for the uh, for the exhibit and the and the catalog. So all the different places in in, in uh, the DePaul administration and and uh, various elements of the DePaul community that uh, um, uh, committed funds to this uh, this project. First off, uh, Chuck Suchar in the uh, LNS Dean's office was really extraordinarily generous both last year and this year for the catalog and uh, for this event. And uh, so uh, we owe a great debt of gratitude to to that office and to him. Um, <clears throat> we also uh, 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 are very thankful for the, the, the generous support of a number of departments um, here at DePaul, the, uh, the philosophy department, the, the department of uh, history and of uh, art and architecture, um, the uh, department of uh, modern languages and the department of environmental uh, science and environmental studies. Uh, they all um, uh, uh, helped out uh, significantly. Um, we're also uh, very grateful for the support of the Humanities Center and, uh, and the uh, Institute for uh, Nature and Culture. I know Randy, I don't know if I saw him earlier, so thanks so much for, uh, to Randy and to, to Liam at that institute. Uh, here at the museum, I'd like to personally uh, thank, um, first of all, Louise uh, 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 for, uh, for her, um, well, for her infinite patience uh, with me. I've, I've never done anything like uh, uh, organize an exhibition or catalog before, and, uh, and many of you probably think of me as a fairly cordial and, and, and uh, uh, collegial person, but if I have something I really believe in, I can become quite arrogant and demanding, and Louise exhibited just infinite patience at every step of the process, and uh, saved me from making numerous disastrous decisions along the way with her uh, just a, a intense respect for the work at every step, but also her knowledge and, and, and experience. Um, so uh, uh, she's been really terrific. Uh, uh, Laura Fatimi, I'd like to thank for the, the design of the exhibition. Uh, it looks fantastic, Laura. It's really uh, just, so the whole concept is just perfect and couldn't, couldn't be better. Um, Gregory Harris, uh, for the, uh, I think, uh, who, who uh, uh, installed the, the, the exhibit as well and, and worked on it with Laura. And Allison Kleinman, who organized this event, uh, uh, all those people here at the uh, at the museum. Also, Dominic Fortunato, who was the designer behind this uh, the catalog. And uh, this was Louise's concept, actually, the whole uh, the, the Gallimard sort of reference to the, the, those uh, French editions. But the uh, but the uh, but the, the design was carried out by Dominic. That's really, I think, uh, 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 created a quite extraordinary object. I'd also like to thank the many <coughs> contributors from the DePaul community. Um, uh, and beyond that, uh, that uh, contributed uh, in short responses to the uh, to, to Peter's works. Um, we have uh, uh, people contributing from two different colleges here at the university and five different departments, as well as from other universities and colleges as well um, outside of Nepal. But I really wanted to thank all of them for the, the thoughtfulness and the and the seriousness with which they they, they, they took up these works. And, and I think the the, the catalog is uh, is an extraordinary object because uh, in part because of their uh, their. their Thank you to all of you. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Aaron Packer, who is uh, 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 Peter's uh, uh, dealer uh, from uh, Packer Shop uh, Gallery for his support um, throughout the, this, uh, uh, the, the project. Um, he, uh, he'll, he'll be here later, but he, uh, and I also wanted to mention that he has another uh, exhibition of Peter's works 
uh, in February and March of 2013, uh, Peter Carklin's Mother Earth that will be up at the uh, Packer Shop Gallery. Um, and so he's uh, been a real great supporter of Peter and, and helpful uh, during this whole process. Lastly, I'd like to thank also uh, Ryan Feigenbaum. Where's Ryan? Because he's the one that really started the whole project as an undergraduate student here before he went off to uh, PhD studies in philosophy at, uh, at Villanova. He, he's the one that brought the works to my attention and, and really started the, uh, the ball rolling. Uh, so uh, the whole thing really wouldn't have happened without, without Ryan. Uh, he was also has a, has a terrific essay in the cabinet uh, as well. So, and finally, I want to thank Peter uh, Carklins, the artist, um, for allowing the, the museum to display these really, I think, intensely powerful and, and uh, extraordinary works. Um, it seems to me that, that if we try to characterize these works, we, we think about what, right, what, what characterizes art in general, what, 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 what art is, and one way of starting to imagine that is to think about what it's opposed to, what, what, what its opposite is in some way, what its, what its uh, conceptual contrary is. And, and I think that art can't be understood to be set over against and opposed to something like the ugly, or, uh, or maybe something like the unskilled, or something like the bad or the worthless. Uh, what has artistic value, what is truly art, I think is more properly understood as the opposite of the familiar, uh, the commonplace, the, the comfortable, <coughs> and in some sense even the pleasing. And it seems to me that the very essence of the, the work of art, its sort of engine in a way, its moving source, is disruption. Uh, disturbance, even. Uh, uh, the art object, I think, exists in some way in the moment of breaking free from convention, breaking free from, from constraint. And therefore, in some really fundamental sense, the art object must be, I think, troubling in, its, in the shock it produces, in the, the unexpectedness. Uh, that we experience when we confront it. I think it has to be unsettling. And so in this sense then, I think even art is not opposed either to nature. <coughs> because especially if we understand nature, and in a certain sense, that is if we understand nature to be something <coughs> that recognizes and agrees to be governed by really only one law in the end, and that's the law of constant self-overcoming, infinite excess, infinite self-othering, self-transformation at the most fundamental level. If that's really the only law of nature that in the end we can recognize, then in that sense art might be the most natural thing of all. And when I look at these drawings from Peter Carklin's that's the dynamic that I see at work in them, is that natural expression, that movement of disturbance and disruption that marks a true work of art. And so I think, in some sense even, their object, what they present us with, is the dynamic process of art itself, that disruptive, disturbing process. And that's what I see in, in these works. So I hope you'll have some time uh, tonight to stare into them, to spend some time with them being unsettled and bothered and even provoked by them. So to start events off, we're going to um, uh, uh, have a, a, a sort of a, a, a musical element to, to tonight's uh, 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 festivities. And, there's some way that it, maybe that demands some explanation as to why we are having a musical element of all. And there's a, there's a sort of a, a biographical or a sort of a, a historical uh, a response that is, if you look at uh, a number of the works here, especially the work that's on the cover of your, uh, your uh, uh, programs, you'll see that as Peter's marking, cataloging all of the work that he's done on some of these works, some of them over a period of years, he also marks various associations, 
not titles so much, but associations, and even music that is providing, in some sense, the medium in which he's working, the, the site in which he's working. And so it seemed for that reason that a musical element to tonight's festivities seemed, uh, would be fitting. But even, even more than that, probably substantively, I think there's, there's a certain musical logic to Peter's works. That is, the way that elements and themes are repeated and combined in a somewhat liquid fashion, that seems to me to have the order of, of the work of art that is music in a lot of ways. And there's, a, I think, a, a real resonance there. And so even for substantive reasons, we thought, and Peter suggested, we should try to have a musical um, uh, uh, element to tonight's um, event. And so when Peter suggested that, I thought immediately of Rodrigo Terezo, who is a uh, graduate of DePaul's School of Music. He also uh, studied with a number of us in the philosophy uh, program, especially when he was pursuing a uh, Master of Arts in Liberal Studies here at DePaul. He's now a uh, PhD student at Emory University in the Department of uh, Comparative Literature. And uh, so I approached Rodrigo and asked him if he would come and, 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 and play for us uh, somehow in response to these works. And he, he agreed and he even agreed to compose an original piece that is a response to these, maybe to something like nature as it expresses itself and presents itself to us through these drawings. And so that's what Rodrigo is going to do for us. It's a, you can act of extreme generosity. He's been at work on it for months now. Uh, so, uh, 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 and as a kind of a, 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 an entree into that uh, performance, he's also picked out a number of uh, pieces that in some way will prepare the ground for that, will help us sort of uh, uh, start to, to, to experience the relationship between art and, and nature in a certain way. Um, and so, uh, you'll see in, in the program uh, that you have there the, uh, the, the list of uh, uh, short pieces that he's going to play. Also, um, the, uh, the, the name of uh, the piece that he's going to play is original composition to Empedocles after Peter Parkins. And that'll be the last uh, piece that he plays. One change, uh, uh, Rodrigo has uh, uh, switched out the second piece, Ludwig uh, von Beethoven's uh, Sonata Number no. 8, and he's uh, going to play instead uh, uh, Robert Schumann's uh, from Kinderseiden of Foreign Lands. That's the, uh, it's a, a selection from, from that. So that's going to be the, the, uh, the, the second piece of the play. So with that, um, I, uh, I ask you to welcome uh, Rodrigo Terezo and uh, I'll turn the floor. Thank you. It might be a good idea to make sure that your phones are off at this point. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you, Sean. Let me say a few words before I go to this thing. I would like, first of all, to thank Professor Sean Kirkland for making this undeniable invitation to me and confining a rather daunting task to me as well, to play some music for you all as we say in the South, about nature, fuzis, natura, and to compose a piece that responds to drawings by Peter Kirkland, nature drawings, as he calls them. I have selected a few pieces from the rather canonical piano repertoire, which seem, in my estimation, to echo a peculiar intimacy with Cartman's drawings. What is it between Bach, Chopin, Schumann, Brahms, Villalobos, and Cartman that lets me intimate to you a peculiar intimacy between them? Approximately, and for the most part, an irreducible spacing, which lets difference be. When the time comes, if it comes, I will briefly say one or two words. No, just half a word on this irreducible spacing, which lets me see it as such in Cartman's drawings. For now, all I will say about the peculiar intimacy between the pieces you are about to hear and Cartman's nature drawings is this. Multifariousness. Multifariousness in multifarious forms forms that are forms only insofar as they deform and unform. From Bach to Cartman's, polyphony is the very mark of each piece I have selected to play in a manner which is faithful to this very mark, to this mark without mark that polyphony and multifariousness seem to be, if being here can in fact even be, 
without having an X mark erase it, effacing while at the same time letting its legibility, its shadow, its enigma linger for a while. And if I say from Bach to Karkins, it is because I'm going to play Karkins, or better put, Karkins will play me playing Bach. He will have played me, always, already. And for that, I'm grateful.
awful piece I have composed. <laughs> Trust me, it is a terrible piece. I don't even think it's even a piece. Maybe it's a piece of a piece. A fragment of a fragment. But anyhow, before traumatizing you with my horrible monster, let me get back to that half word, that little piece of a word I promised you all before this public humiliation for which I apologize. After spending, splendid, after spending splendid afternoons in the Black Forest this summer, I lived in Freiburg for about four months. Even though my stay was interrupted for a short monastic experience, in the north of France, where I stayed in a very strange and hospitable abbey. A maison d'arrêt, perhaps, as the French say. After all that, after Freiburg and a nice monastery, I approached Peter Karkman's drawings. Or, much better said, the drawings approached me. And they approached me with their irreducible uncanniness, strangeness, and monstrosity. In Cartman's drawings, there is unmistakably an element of monstrosity. An element which cannot be an element, a thing, a presence, fully present, in a saturated now, which we would be able to fully experience. No, a full experience of Cartman's drawings is essentially impossible, precisely because the drawings themselves are that very impossibility, and an impossibility that nonetheless constitutes and marks them. It is this movement of becoming possible, when the drawings suddenly allow us to draw near them and find them all the more enigmatic, all the more unidentifiable in their self-difference, their self-otherance. It is this play of letting see while withdrawing. Yes, the drawings withdraw, don't they? It is this relation to the other, to the whole other, the non-present other, another who or what is older than the past and beyond the future, another so strange, so monstrous. It is this trace that announces itself to me, that constitutes me and Cartman's and his drawings. But how many impossibilities? No, this trace cannot be as being fully present. It cannot announce itself because it is silent. This trace precisely escapes the first question of philosophy, TST, what is? This trace, therefore, cannot belong. It is not a thing, a possession. This trace isn't mine, and most especially not Cartman's. It is this trace as a spacing, a movement of infinite referrals and deferrals that let us infer, that, let us, that lets us intimate without any intimacy just what constitutes the enigma of Peter Cartman's drawings. Perhaps some of this enigma, just barely a tiny little piece of it, a piece of a piece, Perhaps this piece is nothing more.
uh, the next uh, uh, section is that we'll, uh, we'll have a, a, a question and answer, some open discussion with, uh, with uh, Peter Carklins about uh, his process, about the works themselves, and about art in general. And I hope you'll uh, all uh, ask questions, or not all of you, obviously, but some of you. Uh, but what I'd like to do now is maybe take uh, 10 minutes and uh, 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 make sure that everyone has something to drink. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and please, let's thank uh, uh, Rodrigo. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, my idea here was to just have something quite uh, uh, open and unscripted, uh, uh, and uh, I just uh, uh, wanted to um, uh, give uh, Peter the uh, the opportunity to uh, to discuss his art and to, to field some questions about uh, about about his process, about the the drawings. These draw this particular series of drawings and, and about the role of art in general. I think it's very interesting things to say, uh, 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 and, uh, and I, 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 I think you will too. Um, so I just thought I'd open up the floor uh, uh, to, uh, to, to 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 questions or, or comments to anyone. Uh, so if you're if you're thinking of anything or you'd like to, to ask a question, please please raise your hand. Liam, please. Uh, yeah, I just want to be. Um Natural historians, I guess, at the fall. I'm real interested that the title of the um, exhibit is The Nature Drawings of uh, Peter Carpenter. And I'm wondering whether you're, what do you think of that title? You know, that these are nature drawings, and um, maybe if you want to just say a little bit about what you think, uh, what we should be thinking about nature in, in terms of representing the art. But I'm, I guess I'm, I'm primarily interested just in that question of. How you respond to the title of the of the exhibition was? Well, the original title I wanted, and uh, we didn't have time to do it when we went out to the Library of Congress. The title was not supposed to be uh, the Nature Drawings of Peter Carklin's. It was supposed to be uh, uh, Peter Carklin's Mother Earth, and uh, the letters in Earth, the second, third, and fourth letters in Earth spell art. Oh, so I'm probably more concerned with maternity than uh, than bugs, which also <laughs> also which also inspire me greatly. Uh, uh, as a child, uh, my mother and father did a, well one very very wise thing. Uh, they outlawed television in the house and home. There was no TV, so I used to. I lived at uh, that time at 5543 West Diversity, and uh, uh, immediately to the east was, a, was an empty <coughs> lot that was filled with snakes, garden snakes, beautiful spiders, all kinds of rocks and all kinds of stuff. And I'd like to go into that empty lot and uh, throw grasshoppers into the garden spider's web. <laughs> a real monster. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I also noticed that I'm looking for the snakes, garden snakes. I would sometimes turn rocks over, and there are all these little crazy prehistoric bugs running around, and, and they disappeared into the earth right away. And, uh, and that's like in my artwork, there's these things submerge and then they re-emerge. Uh, so, that's pretty good about nature. <laughs> <laughs> appearing and disappearing bugs. Unfortunately, the bugs are disappearing. And the birds are going to starve to death. And this... This world, which I hate, has to be destroyed <laughs> because I love creation. <laughs> creation is endangered. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's my battle cry. <laughs> that's terrific. Okay. Anyone? Yeah, Peter, please. This is a very materialistic question. But can you tell us how you produce the works? Do you, they're so small. Do you use a magnifying glass? And, and what are the no, materials that you no, use to uh, create the, the, the reason they're so small, first of all, is uh, uh, 
I went out of I, I, I went out of business as an architectural model maker, and uh, of course before that as an artist anyway. And model making was a sideshow to make, to make a couple of dollars. And my poor dad couldn't put the bill for all the paint I like to use. <laughs> uh, they were done on a in a very closed environment, an old security booth at night. I didn't have room to you know, switch up a canvas and go have a lot of fun, no. And uh, I also, at the time that I started working in this way, I was uh, borderline homeless, just about there. And I said, why, what, what am I going to do? I make a big uh, six foot by four foot painting like I used to like to do? Not possible. But with these little drawings, I could put them in my pocket and walk away. That's why they're so small. I also, in the act of drawing uh, or painting, uh, if you go from here to there, that takes a long time. But from here to here, it's fast. It's explosive. It's, uh, it, I don't have time to think. And I think. Uh, rational thinking is the strongest enemy of thinking. I got that from my digger. <laughs> <laughs> and actually in the beautiful little book, not from Heidegger, well, of course it's from Heidegger, but uh, and William Barrett's uh, Irrational Man, uh, an opening paragraph. Uh, William Barry beautifully says uh, that just what it says it, it, it is uh, logic and reason are the strongest enemy of thinking, even though for all the ages reason and logic have been uh, like just so great. Gotten us into a lot of trouble. Irrational man uh, is that I don't value irrationality itself. But I think in, uh, in the irrational modes of knowing. And the analytical philosophers will chop my head off for this, but uh, we don't have any of those. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. I, 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 I made orders that you could do them. Uh, there's music, there's poetry, uh, there's uh, theater. With painting, you know, and uh, those are our modes of knowing. I think uh, that's that. I uh, very much uh, love music. Uh, ever since I was a little child, I, I just love music. The first time uh, I heard Beethoven's Fifth Symphony uh, at the age of maybe, maybe I wasn't even quite seven. It is the first recording my father purchased uh, when he uh, immigrated to the United States. And he had a job and he bought a recording. It was conducted by Bruno Walter. I still remember the recording. And I was a very frightened and insecure child. And Beethoven's mightiness kept me alive. Okay, any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I just, I noticed that your drawings are, are created in many different kinds of contexts. So sometimes you're on a train, for example, and sometimes you're at a desk. Uh -huh. I was just wondering if you thought that those different contexts affected your drawings. They may have, without me knowing so. Uh, what was going on at that time in my life was that uh, uh, my architectural uh, model building business had gone underground. I have another comment about that later. I was not replaced by a computer. Uh, what was going on in my life at that time was uh, that my entire support system of friends had died. 
my friend Carmel Campoli had died. My friend Paulsa Coyne had died. Uh, my friend Kate Schwartz, who had made something of a name for herself, was uh, hiding from the mafia somewhere on her swing in Washington, D.C. And I didn't have any money at all. And I'll, I'll, I, anyway, I, I had to make uh, you know, my child support payments, and, uh, and I had a job as a security officer. Uh, all I could afford was those. Some of these, unfortunately, some of the little works were done on scratch paper. I bought a tool, Osco, you know, for cutting down telephone numbers or something. I'm so happy that also that I have friends who are scanning them and putting them on archival papers. So they at least last a little while. Uh, but under the circumstances that I were going to. The circumstances of my life and my art are, of course, always paramount. Because I don't believe in this uh, self-taught. You know, everything that an artist does, in my opinion, is, uh, is uh, contingent of everything around him. But if I can say, oh, have you been influenced? Yeah from every bug and every artist I ever met. <laughs> Sometimes the bugs were a little more successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alex, please. Could you speak a little bit about the relationship between the types of works that contain words and numbers, like the one on the front and the one on the back, ones that are, are more, have signs and uh, words and ones that are purely pictorial, what the relationship between them are? Uh, uh, I'm turning old and I have trouble hearing. <laughs> so you're wondering about the, the, the relationship between the, 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 the fronts of the images and, and some of those that are oh. the, the, uh, the back? Oh, well. Um, <clears throat> well uh, so Alex, the the, 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 the the more pictorial uh, uh, pieces, the, the those is, are those is, are the fronts. Is there a relationship, or okay. is there not a relationship? The back side of yeah. the, of well, one I, of the, I, 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 okay, okay. Yes, now I understand. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I'm, I'm, yep. I'm getting it. Uh, first of all, it, it was uh, a lot of the things I've noted down were uh, uh, on, on, on the back sheets uh, have nothing to do with the image on the front. Uh, I, I noted that, uh, like, uh, free here on top it says uh, uh, Giorgio Allegri Miserere. Oh, no, it's a very beautiful piece of music. Oh, I had heard it before, but somehow I loved it, so I wrote that down. Now, Allegri Miserere has nothing to do with the cover on here, on the, on the page. Is it just something that I was at work? There's a, two or three or four in the morning. Um, and somehow touched me, so I noted that uh, the meticulousness is uh, about the, the notations is not altogether very accurate. But the compulsiveness is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, why I wrote down these dates and times, there's also uh, a multiplicity of reasons why. And uh, <coughs> of course, I was working as a security officer to make my child support payments and keep myself alive, and not enough to pay my rent. I. Uh, I had to, in security, you have to write the date and time and what's going on, you know. It, it's called in security, called DAR, Daily Activity Report. So if anything happens or if I get compromised or whatever, there's a, a written record. This was, this was what was here. Uh, but the other date and time was, uh, I can't talk about it because it's too emotional. Thank you.
the date and time that Latvian regiments went into action against the German army. They blunted their offensive. Well, the Russian army drank what come around. There were monuments, dates and times. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> that also, in days and times, uh, one of my favorite composers, sandwiched between Beethoven and Gustav Bader, is Anton Bruckner. Uh, in one of my books on Bruckner, uh, there's a, a photocopy of uh, one of his little schedules where he had uh, written down and scheduled which prayers he said at what time. I think that art, my art, has a lot to do with prayer. Now oh, that's a juicy one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm curious about how the um, how your work might have circulated before this moment. Um, I'm curious if when you were making your work, there were other audiences at, at any point? I had no audience. No, no audience, it was just you. you I, and all my, 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 my uh, as I said earlier, uh, my, my materials friends who are, are artists around me, who believed in me, and that was my support system, uh, they had died. And uh, I went off into the, uh, and I had to make my child support payment or uh, I'm going to be uh, tossed in jail for contempt of court and not making it. And I said, my God, I had to make child support payments. So the only thing I knew how to do at that time, as an architectural model builder, I was a, I was a dinosaur with a monster. Uh, they, some guy, <laughs> one guy gave me an interview and I showed up with my portfolio and uh, and he introduced himself to me on the phone. Oh, yes, I'm the chief of production, and I do this, and I do this, and uh, we will show you. Oh, yes, we need somebody who knows screen printing. And uh, so I took my resume and uh, went down to see him. And uh, he looked at me. And then the poor little boy let the cat out of the bag. He said, well, you and I don't have any contact. And then he showed me a little sample of what he had done, and then he showed me out the side door. So there were my chances for employment. <laughs> uh, but back to your question, it was uh, <coughs> how this really happened. Uh, I really do not understand myself. I don't. I don't get it. This was just a, a strange visitation, and there it is. Was that, was, was that pretty close to your question? <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I also, uh, uh, I talked to Sean Kirkland about it before, about uh, these drawings where I'm just about dreaming with my eyes open. And I remember recovering in a, and being in a hospital, recovering from a nervous breakdown. And my doctor Rodriguez asked me, well, Peter, you have any dreams? at the doctor and I said, no. And he said, what? An artist in no dreams? And I looked at Dr. Rodriguez and I said, I'm an artist. I dream with my eyes open. <laughs> at, at, at that point, Dr. Rodriguez, <laughs> since I was hospitalized, he said, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Dr. Rodriguez was my doctor from uh, 1965 until uh, he had a stroke in 1988 uh, and uh, he retired. Uh, he was my greatest supporter aesthetically, spiritually, psychologically. And uh, I remember my uh, first meetings with him, I, I talked like this stupid nonsense like a, like a young kid. And, uh, said, get serious, or you're wasting my time, and you're wasting your time. And the next time I 
I brought down my artwork under my arm and it was just breaking my arm and I thought, holy Christ, you know, I got like 50 pounds of paintings and art drawings and I showed them to him in his office and he looked at all of them very carefully. And then he looked up at me and he said, Peter, you are a creative artist. And it was very, very, very baby works. Look at it very seriously. He said, Peter, you are a creative artist. He saw that I could create from my imagination. I wasn't drawing very flowers or. <laughs> yes, there is majesty in these little works. And uh, I'm, I'm willing to go into that a little bit, admitting that uh, I couldn't completely. Uh, and reading, uh, well, not reading, browsing. That's what I do. I don't have the patience to read a whole book. That's bullshit. I'm <laughs> 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 uh, reading Carl Jaspers. Uh, and, uh, What's the name of the book? Living, Living Philosophers, Southern Illinois University. Well, I don't know. I don't know that book. The bunch of, a whole bunch of books, the whole series. The library. Oh, oh yeah, the series. Yeah, yeah. Library of Living Philosophers. And uh, Carl Jaspers, uh, I had a, had a good one about art. Well, art, he said, shows. A religious person will say, revelation. Said, what shows? Whatever wells up from the infinite depths of being. Now, that's true. But I, 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 how can I understand that? I think uh, I, I, I draw. I I draw all this stuff. I have no idea of content or any of that. I uh, I'm working on composition. Of working. This is. Well, at, at 4 o'clock in the morning on a 12-hour shift, you, you, you just have crazy ideas. And uh, you start hallucinating. <laughs> this move, there's a movement in the composition that goes this way, there's a movement that goes this way. And I'm mostly concerned about visual aesthetics of what I'm doing. The fact that there's content uh, is incidental. After the fact, I start wondering, what the hell, what the hell is this supposed to be? <laughs> and I'm asking the question that every person asks, what's it supposed to be? Now, there's a taboo question in the art world, but I love to ask it to all the art. I love to go to art fairs and art events, and I look at but what's this supposed to be? <laughs> you like a moron. Well, that's not a question that you're supposed to ask. And I say, right. They're ignoring the science flag. <laughs> <laughs> the question of being, and most of the questions that my friends are asking are the same questions I'm asking. And uh, the questions that may be asked about my work are the same questions I'm asking. I'm wondering what the fuck is this supposed to be? <laughs> And uh, I have hints. Uh, I have the best hints, the best, uh, uh, the best, uh, oh, the best is the wrong word. Uh, what helped me a little bit, and I just stay away from that because I, it's not good. Uh, I, I should keep working artistically and not analytically. And, uh, I had to drop all that. And that's also what my doctor advised. You and Peter, just read the psychoanalysis that you had to do for school, and please stay away from it. <laughs> he said, he told me that my imagination was too good as it was, and, <laughs> and I, I shouldn't wander into that territory. Uh, but what shows would come to present? So, what can I say? Tremendous. 
Gabriel Marcel called it the mystery of being. In the Middle Ages, he called it stadium tremendum. And then being in time, Heidegger couldn't talk about the real being in time. He and the philosophical anthropology. <laughs> That's what I, mean. I read like that myself, but uneducated as I am, and I'll, I read later, browsing, of course, in these uh, books that I buy and can't read. Uh, but the uh, the teacher accused him of. Heidegger, this is, this is philosophical anthropology. It's not phenomenology. And, but I, uh, I'm not a man of character. I, 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 I can't take a project on and carry it through. Uh -huh. And play around to look at it, enjoy it, learn from it, think about it, and then I just had to go my way. That's what the teacher said about being in grammar school, the little boy. The teacher does not do his homework. He sits in class and he looks out the window and draws pictures. I've been looking out the window. drawing pictures. For me, is the highest calling that man can have. Dolores? Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about why you work in pencil? I mean, was that a choice that you was based on that was what was available to you? Would you have worked in color? I'm just thinking about that. Wondering. Well, uh, I have a good answer for that one. I started uh, as a child in pencil drawing. I learned oil painting, which I know how to do. I also know how to paint in uh, uh, watercolors with some skill. Uh, I also know how to paint in alkyd oils. I know how to engrave a copper plate with some control. Not etching, in great work, great yurt. And uh, I'm also an architectural model builder, or, or among many, many, many architects who knew me, uh, understand me as the best architectural model builder in the United States. Not because of my ability to include tiny pieces, but the overall aesthetic. Uh, I was the best. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's some misinformation on the internet about, uh, about me uh, losing my business to computer model building. I mean, that's total bullshit. It's completely wrong. I don't know where that originated. The way I uh, uh, exited architectural model building was because I was trying to exit it because architects, as far as I could see from my limited perspective as a model builder, were not doing their job. They would draw stuff up, it was incongruous, <coughs> they send the drawings out, and they would expect the product. And I had to hire my architect to look at this, draft it up, so I could proceed to make it what, what it was supposed to be. Uh, that was with, with Perkins and Will. And uh, <coughs> my last contact with Perkins and Will was that they contacted me to make an architectural model for them, but they needed it for a toe. And I looked at them and I said, no, <laughs> goodbye. And they said, well, goodbye, Peter. And I said, goodbye, Perkins and Will. Uh, and that was all in the transition from, yeah. The architectural model building. Um, but what, what, what's been on the internet is that I, I was a model maker through the 60s. I was not a model maker through the 60s. I became an architectural model builder 
as an apprentice model maker the 5th of March 19, uh, what the hell was it? It was uh, 76. Now I'm getting a little confused. Yeah, I had to go back right now. I don't want to do that. Uh, it was a uh, Seventy-six. Or was it sixties? Sixty. Sixty. Nineteen sixty-eight. March of nineteen sixty-eight. I became an apprentice model maker at C. F. Murphy Associates. Later, to become Murphy Young. Uh, and I worked there until uh, for, for a number of years. And thereafter, I, w I went on and became chief model builder for Perkins and Will. International, where I did many, many, many important projects for them. Uh, well, Perkins and Will collapsed. They went under. The bank would not give them any more money. I was aware of that, so I purchased the tools. So in 1985 to 1992, I was in business for myself as an architectural model builder. And while I was trying to develop a business and get business, uh, here we have a funny one. At the same time, I was working myself out of the business. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I need the job, I need the cash, and now I got the goddamn money, go to hell, leave me alone. <laughs> and uh, oh, that, that all came to kind of a halt. And, uh, I, uh, I, 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 I got a job at security uh, so I could keep business hours open. And, uh, Worked at night to make some money during the day, pursue my business, and well, thank God it did not work out that way. At my time, I sat around in my armor, got my toasts, and yes, that did happen. But that I was used to it by some kind of computer, no way. No way. What about, what about the pencil? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but why, why you use a pencil? Convenient. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, since I make a lot of mistakes, the pencil can be erased mm -hmm. by working with ink. Tell, tell me about the, how you use the eraser to, uh, to remove... Uh, oh, the, oh, the little technical nonsense? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 would, I would draw. Now, Usually, uh, I would take a, I, I would always bring my paper around like I in my pocket right here. <laughs> I would carry it in my pocket on the train or or on a, or on my job location or standing in the streets when doing guard duty. The one walk to the front door because there's bad guys around. <laughs> Uh, I would draw in pencil, and uh, and then uh, of course everything would go black because I kept changing and changing and seeing things and seeing things and seeing things, and uh, it turned dark. But then I would take my neater eraser and I'd start excavating and digging in back into the images that I had originated previously, and. Uh, one of the little tools I devised for myself that I would see something that was good, but I want to bring this up. The, the, the neater eraser does not lift this, so I would take a little piece of the eraser and glue it to a toothpick with crazy glue, and uh, I would go in and get my little highlights and, and bring it, bring things up. The presence, presence is one of my favorite words. Okay. <coughs> Yeah, Elizabeth. I'm just wondering about the drawing and the erasing and the redrawing. How long does it take you to make one of those drawings that are? Some of them happen very abruptly, and some take forever. And I have a whole bunch now. I have like 40 paintings I've started that, well, let's see what happens. Uh, uh, Ten years, uh, 
on the post as a security officer. I produced approximately 50 paintings. So that's around, what, what the hell is that? Four paintings or five, five dr little drawings. They're very labor intensive. And because you, you, things keep coming, they, I, I start seeing. Uh, I change, I do this, I do that. I like to uh, think about some of these things sometimes and uh, And of course, I always loved the surrealists, and uh, I, I took them literally and got myself into a lot of trouble in ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and I still take them literally. <laughs> and uh, I'm still in trouble emotionally. Uh, How do you know when a particular piece is finished? I never know. I never know. Uh, at, a, at a certain point, um, this is a funny point, and this does happen. I, uh, I'm working this and working this and working this and working and working and working. And then uh, all of a sudden, it's just, well, no, it's, 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 it's uh, looking at it and I, I make a few strokes and I say, oh my God, don't touch it. Don't touch it. And that's a very strange, uh, well, this is a confession. It's a, a very strange emotion happens. I say, did I do this? And uh, my eyes water up. And I have a, a strange uh, religious emotion. And then I turn her over and put it away. And, and I look at it. And two months later, I look at it. Uh, what does our has to do with prayer? Beats me. I don't want to touch it. It's too much. Okay? <laughs> <laughs>